Well, good morning, Story Church. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today. Uh, my name is Jeremy. Uh, sorry that I cannot be with you in person this morning. If you're new, uh, I hope you'll come back because I would love the, the chance to get to know you uh, next week or sometime in the future. Uh, but today I am in sunny California, somewhere on a beach. And, uh, and I don't necessarily apologize for that. Uh, I'm, I had the opportunity this weekend uh, to perform the wedding ceremony of a cousin of mine. And, uh, and so it was a great uh, opportunity for Kimmy and I to get away for a few days and, and to, to be there. But um, anyway, today uh, we are doing part two of this series called Citizen. And uh, if you were with us last week, we kicked this off and, and we talked uh, last Sunday as, as we started this series about this dual citizenship idea that we are uh, carriers of a passport from another kingdom, that we are part of the kingdom of heaven. And, and yes, we're here, and yes, we should be active, and yes, we should be a part of what's happening here, but, but ultimately our allegiance lies with the kingdom of heaven. And so sometimes that means that, that we uh, have to bring that to bear on what we're doing uh, here in this place. And so I hope that you were able to be a part of that. If not, I want to encourage you to uh, catch up on the podcast. But this morning, uh, we're going to go into part two. And part two this morning, uh, I'm calling it perspective, because ultimately, that's what I hope today is. I hope it's perspective. I hope it's a chance for you and me to really think deeply about uh, really short term versus long term and, and to think through what God may be doing in a season like this right now. Um, I, I don't know, you know, when you're driving, you've got your, your car uh, rear view mirror right on the side. Most of them nowadays say on it, they say objects in mirror are closer than they appear, right? You, you've probably seen that. And, uh, and, and what that's meant to do is to kind of warn you, hey, things are, I know that looks far away, but it's actually, it's closer than it appears. And here, here's what I was thinking. I was thinking it like almost in, in the reverse of that. Uh, in terms of this climate that we're in is, is we tend to focus on something. We think it's more pressing, more important, more vital than maybe it actually is. So maybe, you know, objects in mirror appear closer than they really are. Maybe it's the other way around. And, and what I mean by that is sometimes the, the doomsday kind of predictors and the people who get on TV or the people who are uh, out uh, campaigning and whatever, they paint a, a picture that often dictates how we start to feel about things. And usually the picture that they're painting is one of imminent doom if we don't act now. And so we tend to start to feel that way. And we tend to start to feel like every time an election comes around, I don't know about you, but I've been hearing it every election from you know, the time I started voting was that this is the most important election of our lifetime. And I, I don't know if you've heard that statement. I've heard it over and over again. And I'm starting to wonder if it's actually just the most recent election in our lifetime. Maybe that's the accurate description. Because, I mean, let's be honest, this thing's coming again in four years, right? And then four years after that and four years after that. And so, you know, I, I just think sometimes maybe we need a little perspective. And so this morning, that's what I want to talk about. I actually want to compare and contrast a few things uh, that we may hear in our culture versus what I think God is actually saying to us and what's going on. And so I'm going to dive right in this morning on a couple of these. And, and the first thing that I want to talk about is the temporary nature of politics versus the permanence of God's kingdom. So you've got this temporary nature of politics and the permanent nature of God's kingdom. Uh, like I said, no matter what happens uh, a few weeks from now on election day, right? Four years from now or eight years from now, whoever gets elected, whatever administration goes into office, they're going out, right? And, and whether, again, that's four years from now or it's eight years from now, there's going to be a transition. There's going to be somebody who's about to go into office now that will be leaving office in four years or eight years. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. It's the way our country works. And, and so sometimes I think we just, we put so much weight into four years of time. I don't know about you, but I think about four years ago, man, it flew by, right? I mean, I can think about, think about the four years of high school that you went to or the four years of, of college. Or think about the four years since the last Olympics. Or some of you soccer fans, the World Cup comes every four years. And you think about some of these things and it's like, 
wow, it actually, it feels like it comes pretty fast, right? Because ultimately, four years is not a really long time. And yet, when we're, when we're coming up to it, when we're close to an election, it feels like this might be the most important thing that ever happens on planet Earth. And frankly, it's just not. It's temporary. It's going to last a certain amount of time, and then it's going to be over. And we're going to have a chance to re-elect somebody or, or to elect somebody new, and this season will end, and a new season will begin. So the temporary nature of politics versus the permanence of God's kingdom. Uh, there's this fascinating passage. It's actually one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. It's from Isaiah 6, and I'll, I'll read it for you in a second. But to set it up, I want you to understand there was uh, several kings in Israel and Judah's uh, history. One of those kings, his name was King Uzziah. King Uzziah uh, became king when he was 16 years old, which, you know, is kind of crazy, right? I mean, but, but he's 16 years old. I'm sure he had, you know, advisors and all kinds of people that were, you know, probably able to drive uh, and, and able to advise him in that way. But, but he reigned, he was the king for 52 years. I mean, no term limits, right? 52 years, King Uzziah was in office. He was the king of Judah. And he was a good king for most of his life, for most of his reign. He was a good king. He was the kind of king that did what God wanted. And, and God blessed him and God blessed the people as a result. There is a point in King Uzziah's life when he starts to do things his own way. And, and it seems like the blessing of God is removed from him during that season. Uh, but, but here's what I want you to think about. Imagine living in Judah and having one king for, I mean, your whole life for 52 years. This guy's been king, and, and the, the, the country has seen prosperity, it's seen growth, things have gone well, and, and all you've ever known is King Uzziah is in control. And when you wake up tomorrow, King Uzziah's in control. And you just, you have this sense of stability, right? That, that things, are, things are okay because King Uzziah's in control, and, and he's doing a good job, and the country seems to be going well, and, and everything's good, but then... King Uzziah dies. And imagine for the first time in, in a generation, 52 years, there, who's going to be king, right? Like suddenly there's questions, there's, there's insecurity, there's doubt, there's what are we going to do? This guy has been king forever. Like does anyone else even know how to do this? How do we find another king? Who's, how do we know if he's going to be good? I mean, what's their track record? And yet here's this guy for 52 years that led us and did a great job, and, and he's there. And I, I want to give you that backdrop because in Isaiah chapter 6, we see this prophet Isaiah. He gets a, a vision of the throne room of God. And I want you to hear how he starts his description of what he sees. It's in Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, in the same year, Right? So uh, again, this is so important. In the year that King Uzziah died, in the year when the guy who's been king for 52 years passed away, I saw the Lord high and exalted, notice, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, which are these creatures. It says, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, he cried, like, whoa, I'm in trouble, right? He says, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, and it blew my mind right? He says there's these creatures, they're flying around and they're, they're screaming at the top of their lungs like 24-7 about the holiness, 
of God. And that, that he's there on the throne and it says the temple shakes because of the voices and it fills with smoke. And it's this, it's this unbelievable scene where Isaiah is so overcome that he says, I might as well be dead. I, I feel like I should be dead right now because I have seen something that is so holy and so other and so amazing that I don't even deserve to live because I, who am I? I'm a person of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. He's like, I should not be allowed to see something so amazing. And so here, in the year that King Uzziah died, in the year when, when the country feels most fragile and when things seem to be uh, out of control and it feels like, what are we going to do? The Lord is still seated on the throne. And that's what I want you to hear this morning more than anything else probably, is that it doesn't matter what happens in November. It doesn't matter what has happened in the past or what will happen in the future. The Lord is seated on the throne. And, and whether one administration comes to an end and another comes in that, that you may or may not agree with, it doesn't matter because guess what? The Lord is still seated on the throne. The, the temporary nature of politics, we've got to keep that in perspective because none of this seems to last. I mean, one group of people passes a law, the next group of people undo the law, and then somebody else redoes a law, and then somebody else undoes that law, or they pass a different law that overrides this law. It, it's all temporary. And yet, in it all, the king is on the throne. Like the real king. Yeah, King Uzziah is awesome, and he lasted 52 years, which is a long time. But there's a king who sits on the throne forever, and he's not going anywhere. No matter who gets elected, no matter what happens in our small corner of this planet, that, that God is seated on the throne. So I want, I want you to know that. I want you to understand the temporary nature of politics. But, but the second thing I think we want some perspective on this morning is this, the limitations of politics versus the unlimited transforming work of God to change people's hearts. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter what laws get passed. It doesn't matter who gets voted in or who doesn't. Uh, politics is limited. There's only so much that a government can do. A government can pass laws and they can try and bring order and structure, but, but what do we see? I mean, there's, there's still chaos, there's still crime, there's still people who choose to do other things. There's no law that you can pass that's going to make everybody just not do those things. They're going to still do them. Now, it helps, right? Most of us who are law-abiding citizens, we decide, okay, well, that's illegal. I'm not going to do that. But God is interested in changing our hearts and not just limiting our behavior. Politics can pass laws all day long, and they can create uh, you know, systems, and, and they, can, they can pass, uh, you know, even amendments. They can do all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it can't change anybody's heart. So I might begrudgingly uh, obey a law, but if my heart still isn't right, if I still hate a certain group of people or a certain kind of person, then it doesn't matter what laws changed. Uh, you know, my heart is still black as can be. And God is in the business of actually changing hearts. Government's important, laws are important, order's important, but they're limited. And there's only so much that, that any governing body can do. But God has the ability to change hearts. In fact, God can even change the hearts of our leaders. He can change the hearts of our president. He can change the hearts of, of cabinet and of government and Congress and, and everybody. God is able to move the hearts of people in, in any direction that he chooses. And, and if God decides that he wants to, to come alongside somebody, he's going to do it. I mean, I think about Paul in the New Testament. Before he was Paul, he was Saul. And Saul was dead set against Jesus and, and his way of life and, and his followers. And, and he was out there to hunt them down and to, to kill them. He wanted to enforce the law on these followers of Jesus. And, and it was illegal. They were not supposed to be doing that, right? He, he's the guy. He was the letter of the law kind of guy. And what happens? Jesus 
goes and meets Paul, Saul, at, on the road to Damascus. And Paul is, Saul has changed. I keep saying Paul. He's changed in a moment. His name literally changes from Saul to Paul. His heart changes. He goes from hating Jesus and the ways of Jesus and the followers of Jesus to becoming a leading missionary for the cause of Jesus, eventually imprisoned, tortured, and even killed for following after this Jesus. God is able to change people's hearts. And as much as politics wants to, to change culture, and, and it does that, and it's able to do that effectively at times through law, God ultimately changes hearts. I was thinking about Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. It says, The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. If God decides to change somebody, if God decides to have an encounter with somebody, then God can do that. And it doesn't matter who it is that gets into office or that gets elected. It doesn't matter if you hate them. It doesn't matter if you feel like they're dead set against the ways of God. God is able to have a, an encounter with them and actually change their hearts. And so you and I, we, we're limited by whatever happens on election day. We can only have so much influence. We can only write so many letters. And our governing leaders can only pass so many laws and they can only get so many votes for it in Congress. But, but God is able to actually change hearts. He has unlimited transforming power. Uh, there's another example in the Old Testament of this guy named Cyrus. He's a king of Persia. And Cyrus was not a, a, of the people of God. And, and God's people had been uh, in, in uh, exile there, and they had been under the control of this, this foreign empire. And it was Cyrus, someone who's not of the Jewish people, not of their kingdom, that ultimately God used Cyrus. And God, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45, he actually refers to Cyrus, this sort of pagan king, as his anointed, as God's anointed the one that God has chosen to use to set his people free. And so God is able to do this. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter their background or what they've done before. God is able to transform hearts. And ultimately, I mean, isn't that so many of our stories? Aren't we glad that even though we were set to go a certain direction, that God reached in and changed our hearts, and he changed our perspectives, and he rescued us from the path that we were headed down. And if God can do that with us, then we have to trust that God is able to do that with our elected officials. Whether you vote for them or not, God is able to change the hearts of people. The third perspective that I want to give this morning is this one. Uh, I want to talk about the love of power versus the power of love. See, I think what happens is so for too many of us, we get enamored with power. We feel like if we can just get the right person in office, if we can just get the right laws passed, if we can just get the right justices appointed, if we can just do this, then we can accomplish all that we want to accomplish. Or, flip side of that, if the wrong person gets into office, we start feeling like, oh my gosh, they're going to have so much power, they're going to have so much ability, and we start to paint this, this picture of doom and gloom. And, and we really have fallen in love, or we started to believe or put our trust in positions of power, believing that they really are ultimate, and somehow, if they get in the right position, either they'll push the thing forward, or they'll, they'll take it in a direction that, that will destroy us all. And, and I've heard this kind of language, and I'm sure you have too. In this election, I have heard people make claims about both major candidates, that if either one gets into office, that we're all doomed, right? And, and you've heard that on both sides are kind of passing that kind of language back and forth. In fact, um, I was reading an article uh, in the Christian Post uh, um, and I, I don't want to mention names specifically here, but there was a well-known Christian leader, a well-known Christian figure, and I'm quoting from him right now. He said, We will go down in flames, maybe literally, he says, if we put the wrong person in power. And then he says, Understand, this is a time when our whole country hangs in the balance. And I'm convinced 
that we will never come back from a bad decision here. This is a leader who believes in the power of God, and yet somehow they have so convinced themselves that apparently a president of America is more powerful than the God of the universe. That if the wrong person gets into office, then surely we are all doomed. Now, a couple of things on that, okay? Obviously, number one, God is still more powerful, okay? The president is not somehow in a higher position of authority than God of the universe. As far as I know, they have not promoted that position that high, right? There's still kind of a hierarchy here. And as far as I know, God of the universe is still at the top, okay? But beyond that, if you think about what is being said here, okay? Here's the deal. What if, what if there's some truth to what he's saying, that, that our country goes down in flames, that somehow America is, it, you know, goes in the tank and, and we're, you know, we're, we cease to be a country? I'm, I'm not exactly sure what he's implying, that, that something like that happens. Okay, so, like, here's the thing, and I know none of us want that, none of us wish that, but listen, kingdoms come and go, right? The Romans were here, the Persians were there, the Egyptians, uh, you think about, you know, uh, Nazi Germany, you think about, you know, all these different powerful kingdoms throughout the world that have come and gone, and guess what? People of God keep moving forward. The kingdom of God keeps advancing. Listen, I am not a doomsdayer, and I do not believe at all that our country is going down in flames because of whoever is elected next. I don't believe that for one second. But if it happened, is our goal as a people of God to make sure that America keeps going? Is that really what God has called us to do? I mean, ultimately, can't we serve God if we become the United States of Bacon or something like that? Like, what happens if we change names? What happens if we change kingdoms? What happens if something else happens? Okay, can't we still serve God? Can't we still be the people of God? And listen, for you and me, I I don't think we want to be dealers in doom. We want to be people who promote hope and say, listen, God is in control. And no matter what happens, God is in control control. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to live with this kind of, you know, uh, fear of what could happen. We don't have to paint a picture of certain imminent doom for all of us. We can have confidence that the God of the universe is still in control, that he's still on the throne, right? That's how we started this morning, that the God of the universe is still on the throne. So we have nothing to fear. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen or not going to happen. Should we be concerned if elected officials are being crazy? Of course we should, okay? And and as citizens of this kingdom on earth, we should be active and involved in making sure that doesn't happen, right? But as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, like we talked about last week, at the end of the day, God is in, he's in control and he's on the throne, And our perspective this morning needs to be beyond our own borders, beyond our own current situation, to say, listen, I don't have to fear and I don't have to worry because I know that God is in control. I was thinking about, you know, the power of love versus the love of power. When we fall in love with power, we're tempted to believe all those things I said a second ago, that if we can just do it right, then somehow magically it'll all be great. But Look at what it says in Romans chapter 8. It says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. In other words, the promise is is that if we're loving God and following Him and serving Him, that God is going to take care of us, that that we don't have to fear. And, And listen, if you and I will focus on simply loving people well, then we don't have to worry about all the other chaos that ensues around us. That God says, listen, the way you change the world is not by falling in love with power, but by understanding that there's power in love. When Peter in the garden, as Jesus is being arrested uh, to be, you know, eventually uh, tried and crucified, uh, Peter 
grabs a sword and he hacks a guy's ear off. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, put away your sword. Put it away. Why? Because we don't accomplish my kingdom through force and violence. We, comp- we accomplish my kingdom through love and through sacrifice. And so what does Jesus do? He picks up the ear and he heals the guy. He puts it back on. He restores. This is what Jesus does. And, and then what does Jesus do? He willingly goes to the cross and he sacrifices himself for the sake of us, right? It, it's, it's an act of love that overthrows the most powerful empire the world has ever seen in Rome. An act of love, uh, Jesus willingly going to the cross on behalf of you and me and and deciding I'm going to do this for the sake of others. I'm going to do this so that God can begin the restoration process of the world. And when Jesus does that, that simple act of love, it actually transforms the world and, and that overcomes this empire of Rome. If you and I have a wrong perspective, what ends up happening is, is it produces fear and uncertainty. But if our perspective is right, it produces peace and confidence. If you think about it, uh, you know, as a parent, I remember uh, my kids when they would run and they fall, right? And, and early on as your first, first child, what do you do? You freak out a little bit because, hey, I don't want my kid to bleed and I don't want them to hurt. And, and you're kind of worried about what might have happened. And, uh, and so they fall and you immediately, <gasps> like you gasp and your face changes and you go running. And, and what does the child do? Generally, they don't cry right away. They look up at you and they see you with a look of panic. And so what do they do? They respond in like kind. They think, I must be, uh, this is supposed to hurt, right? So they just start screaming and wailing. And eventually you learn as a parent that your reaction helps in that moment. And so if you can fight that urge to react in fear and uncertainty, then then it actually helps keep peace and calm. And and what I've noticed is that my kids, things that probably with my first child she might have cried over, now my kids look up and they're like, oh, I guess I'm okay. And they just go back and they play. Because why? Because I didn't react the way that I once did. You and I, when we have the wrong perspective, it produces fear and uncertainty in, in not just yourself, but in everyone. But if we come into the world and we say, hey, yeah, this election, I, I'm concerned about it, but listen, at the end of the day, it's gonna be all right. God's on the throne. I'm not concerned about in some ultimate doom. I'm not fearful. I, I don't feel like you know my life is over if this happens. If we can come in with that kind of perspective, what does it do? It produces peace. It produces confidence in others. Uh, one time I was on this uh, whitewater rafting trip and, uh, and we were in this boat and it was me and, a, and some teenagers and, and uh, there was this guide, the dude who sits on the back of the boat and he's got the big uh, kind of oar and he's sort of steering and we all have paddles and we're trying to paddle and, and uh, these are pretty intense rapids like class fours and fives and, and, uh, and so we were going into this section he's telling us, all right, this section is going to be pretty hairy, it's going to be pretty intense. And so he's telling us what we're going to have to do and we're going to have to really make sure we get over to one particular side and, and we got to go in and when we drop in, we got to drop in going straight on. If we start to turn, it's going to be bad news. You know, he's, he's kind of prepping us for all this stuff. And so, you know, we're a little bit tense already and, and we're paddling, we start going and as we start getting closer to the thing, the guide starts to lose his mind a little bit. And and whatever happened, I don't know, I don't know how they, you know, background check these guys or whatever, but, but I guess we weren't going at it quite right. And this guy started to freak out. And I'm telling you, when you're in rapids with a bunch of teenagers and you're doing your best and he's already painted a picture of doom and gloom and he starts freaking out, it doesn't help the boat, right? Like we are starting to freak out a little bit. And there comes this moment where we're paddling and we're about to drop into the most intense part. And in that moment when you want to hear behind you the vote of confidence and assurance, we hear this guy yell at the top of his lungs, we're not gonna make it. Like that's what he yells, right? It's brutal. 
And so all of us are now freaking out and we're, we're literally die, like going in to the rap, like our boat is go, and it's like we're all just thinking, that's it. We're dead, right? We're dead. It's, it's all over. And of course, it's rapid, so it all happens very fast. And we hit a rock and we bounce around and we, we kind of, the boat moves and whatever. And, and within about five, six seconds, boom, we shoot out the other end. And we're okay. Like no one died. We're all in the boat. We're all alive. We're all excited. I mean, there's a lot of adrenaline and everything. But dude in the back, he almost like, I mean, what are you thinking, dude? Right? Like he, he absolutely created a panic in us that may have made things worse when he's the guy we needed to show some confidence. And I'm just, I just think for some of us, we're sort of, we get that opportunity to sit in the back and sort of steer the conversations right now in our culture. And as people around us are freaking out, we have an opportunity to speak into those moments and to say, hey, you know what? It's going to be all right. You know what? Guess what? Four years from now, we get to vote again. Right? And, and oh yeah, and by the way, the God of the universe is still on the throne. Right? Like we can speak perspective. And, I, and I'm, my hope is this morning as we start to wrap up that you and I can understand this and can live with such a perspective where, yes, we're here, but, but we have this kingdom mindset and we have this understanding that the God that we serve is on the throne, he's in control, and it's going to be okay. We're going to sing some more songs here in a second. I, I, I'm going to invite the band. I can't see them, but they're coming. And, uh, and we're going to sing another song here this morning. Uh, listen, does government matter? Does the vote matter? Of course it matters. Does policy matter? Yes. Uh, should we be engaged? Absolutely. Should we care about what laws get passed? Of course we should. But let's not get things out of perspective. Let's not, let's not forget that the God of the universe is on the throne. I want to read one more passage for you this morning. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> Here's what it says. It says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. And give thanks for them. It says, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And then notice, this is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. When everything was going bad, when all chaos was ensued, when Rome had its foot on the neck of people, and people felt oppressed and they felt, uh, you know, disempowered, they felt, uh, you know, just pushed to the edges, they felt like their voice didn't matter, they felt like, you know, doom and gloom. At just the right time, God gave us Jesus. And he gave us this message that Jesus gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. I think we have a unique opportunity right now in a season when others are losing their minds to speak this kind of truth into people and to say, hey, guess what? It's going to be okay. And at just the right time, we've been given this message of Jesus, the message that promises freedom and security when the rest of the world is in chaos, that we can walk calmly and confidently and full of faith, believing that God is in control, not allowing CNN or anybody else to dictate how we feel about things, but understanding that God is in control. I wonder if God did for us what he did for Isaiah, if God pulled back the curtain and we were able to see the throne room, if we were able to see Jesus on the throne right now, and we were able to see and experience what Isaiah did with these creatures that are unbelievably glorious, and they're flying around, and they're just deafeningly loud 
yelling about the holiness of the one who sits on the throne. And it was so overpowering that heaven itself is shaking. And, and it says there's smoke and there's this, it's just this unbelievable picture. I think our response would be at least as similar as Isaiah's, where we would go, woe is me. Woe. I cannot believe what I am seeing. And if you and I were able to get just a glimpse of that, I wonder how much perspective that would give us when we turn on the news at night. Guys, that's real. And that's happening. And I've got to encourage you this morning. Would you keep your eyes focused on the throne room? Understanding that even when King Uzziah dies, even when all things you know, start to get chaotic, that there is a God on the throne and he's not coming down. Guys, I want to thank you for coming this morning. I want to pray for you. And this band is going to lead us. And, and guys, I just want to thank you for coming out. But listen, we're going to pray and we're going to ask God to give us a glimpse this morning of his power, his holiness, his goodness as he sits this morning on the throne. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love of us. Thank you for this truth this morning. That, that while all things seem to be in chaos, when, when others are saying doom and gloom and, and this is the most important and if we don't get this right, it's all, it's all going down the drain. W would you help us to have perspective? Would you help us to understand that at the end of the day, God, that you are on the throne? Give us this ability, God, to see this, to keep this in perspective. Lord, we pray that you would change hearts and not just policy. And we pray, God, that you would help us not to fall in love with power, but to understand the power of love, to change the world and to change our circumstances. God, we give it all to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.